Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. We are focusing in this first series on the king. Then we'll deal with the keys and the kingdom. When I first began to seek the Lord on what to do to present this important theme to you, he checked me and he said, go back and redefine everything and reintroduce concepts so that the people may understand. And that is why we are having to reintroduce the concept of, first of all, kings. First statement I'd like for you to remember is that the Bible, the message of the Bible is about a king and a kingdom. The message of the Bible is about a king and a kingdom. That's the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is not about religion. It's not about a religious organization. It's not about a list of traditions and rituals. Even though there are rituals in the Bible and there are traditions in the Bible, the Bible is about really a king and a kingdom. The entire Bible is about that. Secondly, the goal of God is and was to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth. So his original purpose was to extend his kingdom on earth from heaven and to have his children, his family, rule that particular territory for him. That's God's concept. That's what he wanted. That's found in Genesis chapter 1 very clear. God said, let us make man, which is a plural word, and let them have dominion over the earth. That is the location. So God is king of heaven king of all creation but he created this planet to be ruled by his own children he calls mankind thirdly the incarnation of God was the coming of a king we heard in the scriptures this morning that was read in the book of Daniel Daniel says I saw a vision and the vision was one who was as the son of man going into the presence of the ancient of days and he was given a kingdom and he was to rule as king forever that was the prophecy about the Messiah we read in the book of Luke and also the story is in Matthew where Jesus came into the earth we find these words in John chapter 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and then it says in verse 14 the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we read in the book of Matthew this morning where it says the wise men came seeking not just a baby but they came seeking what he who was born king so not only was the coming of Christ the coming of God in the flesh but he came as a king that is important he didn't come as a prime minister he didn't come as a president he didn't come as a mayor or a governor he came as what? As what? Say it loud. That's important. In other words, God is not confused about who he is. And it's important that we also not misconstrued what the Bible intended for us to understand. Now, if he came as a king, then it's important for us to understand what a king is and what a king implies. Fourthly, the purpose of Jesus was the restoration of kings and the delivery of a kingdom. That's the purpose of Jesus. His purpose for coming was to restore kings and to deliver to them a kingdom that they had lost. God gave Adam a kingdom. The word kingdom means a king's domain or a domain over which a king has dominion. God told Adam, 
let them have dominion. So you, when, the minute you are given dominion, you are automatically a king. A king is one who dominates an environment, a territory. So Adam, and Adam is referring to all of mankind, not just a person. Adam is referring to the species called man. All of Adam are rulers and kings over the earth, which is the territory God gave us. Jesus came to restore these kings who lost their kingship and their kingdom. When Adam fell, Adam fell not from heaven, he fell from dominion. Adam lost authority and power over the earth when he disobeyed God. Adam lost the spirit of dominion when he disobeyed God. And when Jesus came to earth, his job, his assignment, his purpose was to restore that kingdom that Adam lost back to Adam, but also to restore Adam back to that kingdom. Two different jobs. According to the Bible's chronology, and that means the time of the Bible's text, according to this text, if you study historically the years, from Genesis all the way to Matthew is 6,000 years. From Matthew to today is 7,000 years. So 2,000 brought us into 7,000 years from Genesis, which means based on the Bible, I'm not talking about evolutions and all the guessing they're going through. Uh, and by the way, I am not talking about the age of the earth. The age of the earth, we're not sure how old that is. That, that could be much older than man. But man, according to this text, when God created mankind, if you study and you research the timeline, it's about 6,000 years from Adam to Adam. First Adam, second Adam. The second Adam came to restore what the first Adam lost. What did he lose? A kingdom. And he lost his kingship. That's important. Kingship means his capacity to rule. And he lost the territory that he was supposed to rule. The second Adam came to restore, first of all, the kingdom back to the man, and then restore the man back to the kingdom. That's why he's called the second Adam. Today, from the resurrection of Jesus to now, we have uh, 7,000 years counted from the the birth of Adam or the creation of Adam, the first Adam. Now, Jesus Christ is a king, the king of all the kings. Therefore, the ultimate culmination of God's plan is the return of his kingdom to earth so he can restore what he had from the beginning. God is really not excited, if I can use such a frivolous word in association with God, God is not really trying to get us to heaven. That's not his, his goal. God's goal is to get heaven to earth. God is not really trying to get man to come and live with him. God is trying to come and live with man on the earth. God is not trying to, to create a heavenly choir as if he needs some singers. God is trying to get some music on earth through his children representing him. So God's ultimate goal is not to get man to heaven, but to get heaven to earth. When they asked Jesus, how should we pray? His answer was, here's how to pray. Our Father who is where? In heaven. He's not here. Holy is his name. Then he said, pray this. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done where? On earth. How? Just like it is in heaven. In other words, pray for what's happening in heaven to happen on earth. That's what he says to pray for. Now, to pray means that you give God 
permission and license to do what he wants. And Jesus is telling us what God wants. What does God want? He wants his heavenly influence to come on earth. The same way it is in heaven. In heaven, there is no rebellion. Praise the name of Jesus. In heaven, there is no confusion. In heaven, there is no corruption. Which means God wants that same thing on planet earth. The third planet from the sun. And he wants to do it not himself. He wants to do it through you. That's his plan. Now remember that the, that the gospel, therefore, is the kingdom of God. I want to talk about this for a little bit. Write this down, please. The gospel is the kingdom. Write that down. The gospel is the kingdom. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, one of the most important statements in the Bible, it reads like this. It's the first statement made by Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. It says, from that time forth, Jesus began to preach, quote, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. That was his first announcement. He didn't introduce a religion, he introduced a kingdom. Now turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 4. Quick, quick, Luke chapter 4. We're going to use our Bibles here for a little bit today. Luke chapter 4, verse 43. Everybody say the kingdom is the good news. Jesus is repeating again a statement. In verse 43 of Luke 4, he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Underline that place. Very, very important. He said, the reason why the Father sent me in the first place is to preach not religion, but to preach what? The kingdom of God. The rulership of God again on earth. Now turn with me again to the book of Luke chapter 12. Go forward quick, quick, a few pages. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Now he came to preach the kingdom. But look at this statement. It says in verse 32 of Luke 12, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you what the kingdom underline that is all talking about you so don't don't miss these constitutional statements these are in your constitution the Bible Jesus says it is the father's good pleasure to give you what the kingdom that means God is not pleased if you got a religion he's only pleased if you finally got what the kingdom and that's what we're trying to get we're trying to get out of religion into kingdom why we want to please God God is not pleased if all you got is ritual. God is not pleased if all you got is this religious stuff called Christianity. He wants you to have what? A kingdom. That means God is not pleased until you get it. By the way, uh, uh, this term, enter into the kingdom, is a term that needs to be taught for about three weeks. Because when you hear the word enter, you think of kind of going into something but the word enter that Jesus used means more than that it means to explore and appropriate it's like it's like <laughs> it's like entering a big place but never going to experience all of it in other words born again gets you in the lobby but you got to go and visit all the rooms now some people die in the lobby they, they die saved but they never experience all that is in the kingdom. Are you with me? He says, the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of heaven. Look at Luke chapter 22. Quick, 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 turn the page, a couple of pages across. I'm trying to show you what the gospel is, the good news. Luke chapter 22, chapter 12, verse 32. Sorry, 22, sorry. Luke 22, verse 29. To 30. It's a powerful statement that are underlined. Luke chapter 22, verse 29 to 30. But let me just read just one statement there. It says, I confer on you a what? A kingdom just as my father 
conferred one on me. Can you believe that? Write that down. The word confer here is the same word that is used when a government confers on a citizen the authority to be an ambassador. Hey. Jesus said, look, the same way the Father gave me this kingdom, I am now giving it to you. Confer on you the kingdom. He didn't confer a religion on you. He conferred a kingdom. You received an entire governing authority. Can I hear an amen? amen. Oh, Lord have mercy. When a government confers on you the powers of an ambassador, they literally make you the country. It's going to get you someday. <laughs> when a government confers on you the powers of an ambassador, the government literally makes you the country. When a government confers on you an ambassadorship, they have made you a country. It's not bad when you slap a citizen because that is simply called an assault. But when you slap an ambassador, it is called an international incident because you are touching a country. Let me read again. But the, <laughs> the Constitution says, I have conferred on you the kingdom just like the Father conferred on me. But you get this, young man? When you walk out of this building into this week, a country is walking into the week. A country is walking into that job place. A country is walking into that school. A whole country called heaven. And that means when they touch you or offend you, you are not responsible. Do you understand that? Ambassadors never carry guns. <laughs> An ambassador never carries a weapon. Never. Why? <laughs> He's a country. <laughs> if you touch him, you wake up the entire military. Amen. Do you get it? You gave a testimony this morning. I'm sitting there smiling. Said, Does she really understand what happened? You were standing at immigration, but there were two immigrations present, one visible. See, you don't understand. You got to think that way. And there's one visible. And the Bible says, the heart of the earthly kings is in the hand of the real king. He can blind you with eyes wide open. And he can open eyes that cannot see. He can do anything. Why? He is the real power behind the powers. I confer on you, what? A kingdom. Just like my father conferred on me. Please don't, don't miss the last statement. Just like my father gave me. Ah. Daniel. Daniel says, I, there's one as of the son of man that walked into the presence of the ancient of days. And he gave him what? Power and authority and dominion and a kingdom and when he walked out he says he had a kingdom that was forever he says now he's given you the same thing he's given you power and authority and dominion Amen. the father gave it to him he gave it to you and that is why when paul began to offend and persecute kingdom citizens the government woke up 
and the king personally visited Paul and the king said to Saul what are you doing and Saul said who are you his answer was I am Jesus Christ him whom you are persecuting you get it Paul wasn't touching Jesus or was he tell your neighbor don't fool with me now you see the problem is teaching this listening to this and hearing this is one thing but getting you to believe and accept this is a different story as for me I'm too far gone I literally believe that if you fool with me there are invisible armies that will attack you I believe that so don't fool with me <laughs> You know, when Jesus meant, oh, where this coming from? Anyhow, when Jesus meant on the mount for his final meeting of transfer, <laughs> he had a meeting with two people, official transfer. It, it, you call it the mount of transfiguration. That's not what I call it. It's the mount of transferring. It is the meeting where the official transfer took place from the prophecies about the kingdom to the kingdom. It was the connection between the announcement and the reality. He didn't meet with Abraham, did he? No. Because Abraham apparently never quite caught the kingdom. I find it very interesting that Abraham never worked one miracle. Is anybody here? Abraham never acted on power. He never executed authority and dominion. He was blessed, of course, but he never used power. But there were two who met with Jesus. Who were they? Elijah and Moses. Now think about these two guys. First of all, Moses represented what? The law. And Elijah represented what? The prophets. <laughs> so Jesus said, from the beginning until John the Baptist, the law and the prophets was proclaimed. He says, but from John until now, the kingdom is preached. Oh, hallelujah. The reason, the reason why he met with Elijah and Moses is because these two guys lived kingdom power. Moses dominated locusts. He commanded flies. He spoke to water and made it blood. He told the sea to open. This guy was acting adamically. Matter of fact, Moses felt so much of his power. He told God, I want to see you myself. You all do understand? And God loved Moses. The Bible says God loved Moses like a friend. Why? Moses understood his authority. Yes, let me tell you something, friends. When an ambassador wants to talk to the prime minister, he don't go to no secretary. You all don't understand. No priest and no bishop is needed if you are an ambassador. The red phone on the desk. Moses says, look, I ain't into all this stuff about all this sacrifice and stuff. I want to see you personally God says Moses I like you he said now I I can't let you see me in your earthly flesh because the power will destroy the suit but I'm gonna let you see me 
when I pass by and you'll pick up the atmosphere that'll be enough <laughs> you, you, you will see where I just went you, you will see the nature passing by the glory see there are people who still want to go through people Hey boys, pick up your red phone, girl. No secretary with God. Matter of fact, the secretary lives in you. I confer on you what? A kingdom. A kingdom. It's on me. Say it, it's on me. Tell your neighbor, I got my papers. Come on, man. Say it like you believe it. I got my papers. No, use another word you might understand. I got my credentials. I got my credentials. Now say it loud like you really believe it. I got my credentials. Give the Lord a praise. Amen. I got my papers. Do you know what credentials are? They're not just a piece of paper. They are dangerous. When Nehemiah got credentials from the king, no one could touch it. And the king says, wherever you go, anything you want, they will give it to you. And if they do not, he says, report to me and I will take care of them. See, you don't understand. Some of you are going through some stuff. That's why God sent me to talk to you today. He stopped going through stuff. Just quietly warn them. Give me what belongs to me, okay? And then just walk off. You ain't got to fight. Ambassadors don't fight. In the name of Jesus. Ah! See, this Christianity thing is full of struggles. But the kingdom thing, he has overcome the world, he says. He says, do not fret, do not worry. You have overcome the world. Overcome means what you got, they can't handle. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world system. It's a kingdom. Boy, what a statement. The same way the Father conferred it on me, this thing eats me up. I tell you what, that means you have received the same authority and credibility as Jesus Christ your credit is good in heaven <sighs> angels cannot resist you when you command them <laughs> we don't talk to angels I talk to them all the time now I thought okay I'm boarding this plane now you all take up your position Come on, talk to me. Do you realize the Holy Ghost ministered to me the other day? He said, son, it's real. And then he showed me. I, <laughs> I was going to Pennsylvania. And when we landed, the pastor picked me up at the airport. He says, now, we cannot go the normal route. It normally takes me, he says, about 20 minutes to get to the hotel, but it'll take us about an hour and a half. I said, why? He said, President Bush is coming here tomorrow. No, you all didn't get it. And that they hit me. Two days before he arrives, they locked down the city. There are roads you can't travel, and there are secret CIA guys all over the city checking every street every business house checking everybody two days before he arrives Holy Ghost says whenever you are about to leave I've already been there lift your hands and scream I say lift your hands and shout I say lift your hands and bless his name Some of y'all worrying, well, when I go into the bank, I wonder what 
What you mean you wonder? He already been there. He done locked down those negative people, locked down those negative attitudes. He done shut out them folks. By the time you arrive, everything is in order. Give the Lord a praise. When you are kingdom property, he goes ahead of you, he says. That's why God said, I'll go what? I'll go before you. You royalty. I say, you royalty. I say, you royalty. I remember the first time Queen Elizabeth came to the Bahamas. My God. A year before she arrived, we were sweeping the streets. Some of y'all don't remember that. They had the, the kids out of school. We had to come out of school and take a broom and sweep the road. Could you imagine before you enter a place, God got demons sweeping. <laughs> I say he got some demons. They clear, instead of them setting up for you, they're preparing for you. They're two different things. They are under your feet. When you are royalty and you have the same credibility of God, do you know how long it took preparation before Jesus came? Gotcha. His promise and announcement of his coming took place in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. The woman shall have a seed huh, 4,000 years later. A guy came on the scene talking. His name was John. Ah, uh, preparation is complete. 4,000 years. See, God goes before his people. Let me tell you something. Next week already covered. <laughs> That's why Jesus said, son, he said, take no thought of tomorrow. Because tomorrow will take care of itself. Why? God already in there. He says, only focus on what's today. Enjoy your lunch today. I mean, taste the tomato. Don't just chop it down. Suck on the meat, sweetheart. Good. I mean, enjoy your chicken and say, Lord, thank you for this meal this day. Why? I ain't worrying about the meal next month. Why? That already prepared. Royalty gets preparation. I said royalty gets preparation. I said royalty gets preparation. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. You know, God prepared me 33 years for a jet. And the jet now means nothing to me. He prepared me for it. To me, it's just like a car that I use to get where I need to go, do my job, and come back home. <laughs> in September, in a couple of weeks, our chief pilot's going to go get their training. God bless you, Brother Doc. And we're going to fly in Jesus' name like ambassadors supposed to fly. You all clap like you believe God. Tell your neighbor, me next. See, some of you all don't need a jet because you ain't doing what I'm doing. But you need a better car right now. Come on, thank the king that your car is prepared and it's coming, it's coming, it's coming for you. No one can keep back what the king already preserved and reserved for you. It's kingdom life. God gives you what you need, not what you want. In the name of Jesus. If you start letting people stay in your house, that means you need a bigger house. God will give you a bigger house. It's a little slight one. I thought I'd drop that in there. <laughs> you don't let nobody use your house now. That's why God said, you need a more house because you can get plenty of rooms. No one's using it. So stay in this little house. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't blame you, girl. I'd give something too in the name of Jesus. The anointing for jets on me right now. You better give right now while the jet anointing on me. Glory to God. <laughs> when God puts his credentials on you, 
everything works for you. Nothing can work against you. And sometimes it feels like it's getting close. I mean, God, where are you? God saying, I'm still here. I've been waiting on you. They locked the city down. Be not afraid of evildoers. Do not be dismayed by wicked people. Why? Preparation has already been made for you. God says, I'm not going to feed you in a quiet place. I'm going to feed you right in the midst. Some of y'all waiting for a good situation to have a good time. God is the kind of God who makes good times in the midst of bad situations. He's king. Fret not yourself. Fret not yourself. Let's talk about what kings are like. Number one. Write this down. Number one. Kings inherit kingship by birthright. Number two. Kings must be trained for their role and responsibilities. Kings must be trained. Number three. The glory of a king is all that expresses his nature. The glory of a king is all that expresses his nature. In other words, a king's glory is whatever he owns that expresses what he is like. That's his glory. Number four, the word of a king is law in his kingdom territory. The word of a king is what? Law. It's law. When a king speaks, what he says becomes law in his kingdom. Number five, the power of a king is absolute. The power of a king is absolute. A king doesn't have some power. A king's power is absolute. See, the prime minister of our country does not have absolute power. He has to check with the Senate, the Cabinet, House of Assembly, in order for laws to be made. But a king checks with no one. When a king has a committee, that committee exists at the king's what? Pleasure. When he's tired of it, he gets rid of the committee. You ever heard this term in the Bible? Who can counsel the Lord? And it's always a question. God don't need no counsel. He counsels himself. That's what kings do. Number six, a king's authority is inherent in his sovereignty. A king's authority is inherent in his sovereignty. You know, Prince William in England today, he was not given authority. He was born with it. Prime Minister Blair cannot give Prince William authority. Isn't that incredible? Prince William was born with the authority because he is a sovereign bloodline. Oh, mercy Lord. <laughs> Once you understand that you are a son of God, the devil is in trouble. The devil is not even in the God class. He's an angel, an unemployed cherub. Man is never called an angel. And an angel is never called a son of God in this book. Don't ever be impressed with angels. They are impressed by you. I tell you all something. I repeat this for the last 27 years. The greatest enemy of man is ignorance. What you don't know is killing you. See, if you don't know your authority, then you act sheepish. 
always apologizing. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Why are you afraid of your boss? Especially if they ain't born again. Now, don't get me wrong. We respect authority, but we don't worship it. The Bible says the fear of man is a snare. That means a trap. It entraps you. It makes you unable to get what is yours and move where you're supposed to be and go where you're supposed to go. It entraps you. The fear of man. I will never forget the day I was delivered from the fear of people. And that delivery came from revelation of who I am. A king's authority is inherent in his sovereignty. Number seven, the edict or the decree of a king is unchangeable. The edict or the decree of a king is unchangeable. Now remember, Jesus Christ is not a prime minister. He is not a president. He's a king. The decree of a king is unchanging. The edict of a king is unchangeable. That means when a king gives a decree, you are in trouble. It cannot change. You remember when Nebuchadnezzar, now kings talk, but when a king speaks as a decree, he can't change it. Daniel was Nebuchadnezzar's friend. Daniel was on his staff. Are you listening to me? Daniel was one of his best workers. But the king went temporarily insane and decided that he was God. Insanity. He built this big statue and told everybody to bow down and worship it. And Daniel, who was his good friend, refused to worship it. But the king had made a decree. And the king said, If anyone does not bow down to this idol, they shall be thrown into the fiery furnace or in the lion's den. Interesting. A decree. Now, you remember when Daniel refused to bow down, the report came to the king. Remember that? Do you remember how the king, what the king said? It says the king was sad. Because the king liked Daniel. But he had already made a decree. He couldn't change it. I'm trying to get at something. When God speaks and gives you a word as a decree, you could go to sleep. The economy could collapse. The government could change. The company could fold up. They could downsize, right size, or no size. They could destroy the whole country. But if God gave you a decree, it shall not come near you. Yes. Let me tell you something. You see, in a democracy, <laughs> when your party wins, they could promote you and give you political favor. But when they lose the next election and the next party comes in, you gone. Why? That's not a kingdom. Glory, hallelujah. But if God promoted you in a company and the boss goes and the whole company changes name, and another company bought it? If God put you in that company, in that position, relax, please. Why? It's a decree. They will come there, walk around you, move everybody else, but they can't touch. Oh, come on, give the king a hand. That's a decree.
You know, when Nebuchadnezzar attempted to defy the decree of God, God made him an animal. There are people who are meddling with you right now. I don't know who they are. I don't know who you are. But they're meddling with you. And today the Holy Ghost has sent me to give you revelation that you ain't there because someone liked you. And you ain't there because someone gave you favor. You are there because the king of kings positioned you in that position. And if anyone attempts to touch you, he will turn them into a wild animal. Come on, praise. You believe the word of God. What is yours is yours. Tell your neighbor, I believe this. Say it again, I believe this. You see, I believe this. This ain't no good preaching. This is the truth. You got to get it in your soul that you are in a kingdom where the king makes decrees. If he said it, he will do it. And if he promised it, he will bring it to pass. Not no favor. He will bring it to pass. Say, neighbor, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. What belongs to you is coming. You think they get rid of you? No. The king moved you. Oh, you didn't get that one. Some of y'all think you got fired. Mm -mm -mm. They can't fire you without permission. Number eight, the home of a king expresses his standards. The home of a king expresses his standards. Wherever a king lives, tells you what he's like. That's why they changed the name of a king's home to castle or palace, because it doesn't look like an ordinary house. Hallelujah. You know, I was brought up in Bain Town. We used to sweep the ground with a branch from the coconut tree. Y'all ever did that? Yeah, we used to use that for broom. And we used to sweep the dirt to keep the dirt clean. All around our house was clean dirt. You don't understand that revelation. The dirt was clean. You could eat of the dirt. We sweep it clean. Every Saturday morning, my daddy, mom made everybody sweep. That wooden house on four stones. It was like a palace. Let me tell you something. Palace begins in the mind first. Don't wait for a house to make it a palace. Make your house a palace now, and a palace will be attracted to you. Listen to me carefully. A palace does not make a king a king. <laughs> if you bought one of Queen Elizabeth's house, you still ain't royalty. You can sleep in the same room. You just a citizen sleeping in a bed. If Prince Charles came to the Bahamas and buys a pair of plastic slippers and puts them on, do you know what they are called? Royal slippers. Are you getting it? You give the thing value. It doesn't give you value. Tell your neighbor, the clothes I got on right now, they lucky. Clap your hands right there. Praise it. These clothes lucky. They are on my back. Can I hear an amen? Let me tell you something. Tommy Hilfiger makes his t-shirts out of cotton. Same cotton as Kmart. So Tommy, put TV on me. Tommy, you lucky if I wear one of your shirts. I'm giving your shirts value and dignity. They are on me. They become valuable. You can always tell a person who don't know who they are. They need to wear Nike to feel important. They need to wear Tommy to feel important. 
They need to wear Georgier to feel important. But when you know who you are, you can wear a Kmart special. And when you walk, hey, come on, somebody. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, royalty is in the blood, it's in the blood, it's in the blood, it's in the blood. See, it's in the blood, it's not in the clothes. When you sit in your car today and you step that gas, guess what? It suddenly becomes a royal coach. See, y'all ain't clapping. I don't understand that. You don't need a limousine or a Rolls Royce to be important. Toyotas are fortunate that you bought one. A royal bicycle. Come on, let's talk about it a little bit. A majestic motorbike. Why? Majesty is riding it. Everybody look at your shoes. Say shoes. shoes. You lucky. You on royal feet today. Give the Lord a praise one more time. It's like, it's royal shoe because I got it on. When a king buys a house, it becomes a castle. So go home to your castle today and put your foot up on the stool and eat your chicken with royal teeth. Even the ones you borrowed, praise God. Number nine, very important one, characteristics of a king. Number nine, the reputation of a king is determined by the state and condition of his kingdom citizens. I say it again, the reputation of a king is determined by the state and condition of his kingdom citizens. I'm re-emphasizing this. In other words, a king's reputation depends on the condition of his people. If you study history, there were poor kings and rich kings. There were local kings and great kings. There were poor, there were uh, what they call uh, little kings and then big kings. There were all kinds of different kings in history. And kings were constantly trying to get wealth. Why do empires try to get wealth? Because the wealthier a king is, the more he's able to show his wealth by the way he creates a condition in his kingdom that shows his glory. Jesus is a king. Can I hear an amen? Now, now, I want you to understand this. It's very important. See, <laughs> your reputation is not important if you are in a kingdom. Hold this, man. I got to get this point across. This is too important. Everybody say reputation. reputation. Say it again. Reputation. Your reputation is not important. You see, in religion, everybody wants reputation. So you're looking for position, looking for title, bishop this, reverend that, deacon this, elder, anyone trying to get position. But in the kingdom, Jesus said, look, he said, if you want to be great in this kingdom, you got to be like a little child. Just kind of relax and depend. You know what makes you cry? When you want to help your son and he won't let you. Does that hurt you? Your children. I mean, you see them going, doing dumb things. You say, but son, if you listen to me, if, if, if you just, you know, I got all this money, you ain't got to do that. You don't have to go beg and hang up with these stupid people and, and sell yourself cheap. All this stuff I got for you, this house is yours, everything is, what you do. See, and it hurts you when your children don't let you help them. Do you know why? Because they are trying to be what a kingdom hates independent independence destroys kingdoms think about it how did the Bahamas free itself from the kingdom of Great Britain one simple act Independence. Independence, help me Jesus. Independence is confused with freedom. 
I'm talking to you. Don't, don't miss this. Freedom is not equal to independence. Independence is trouble. Independence means that you have made yourself your own source. That is why our deficit keeps going up. We keep borrowing. Why? Because that's what happens when you are independent. You have to become your own source. Oh, let me talk to you. Please listen to me. Jesus. Oh, what a guy. Jesus is a king, isn't he? He's a king. Listen to him talk. I can do nothing of myself. He calls that freedom. I can only say what I hear my father says. I can do nothing except my father does it. I only do what pleases my father. My father works, so I work. I only do the work that my father does. I came to do the work that my father sent me to do. And without my father, I can do nothing. If you ever heard a dependent statement, that's it. And yet he said, you shall know the truth. The truth will make you what? Free. And the truth is, if you remain dependent, you'll always be safe. Sin is the declaration of independence from God. Adam told God, I don't need you anymore. It's very important. Let me read this one again. Very important. Write this down. You sure you get it? The reputation of a king is determined by the state and condition of his kingdom citizens. In other words, a kingdom, the joy of a king is when the citizens depend on him completely because they put pressure on his reputation. Listen to me, read history. Every time the people came before the king, they would say, Oh, king, live forever. Why? You got to take care of me. <laughs> then they say, oh, great king, there is none like you. They, get the big, they talk to the king big. You are powerful and awesome in all your ways. They worship the king. Why you worship the king? You put pressure on the king when you worship him. Oh, we can do nothing without thee, oh, great king. Thou art our strength. Thou art our protection. Now the king is under pressure. What do you think worship is? Worship is putting pressure on God. If you don't come to God, God can't help you. Isn't that amazing? All right, here's the good part. You thought that was good. Here's the, here's the good part. Hey, boys, a reputation. Reputation means what? Name sake namesake say it again namesake What's reputation <laughs> God's reputation rides on your standards of living <laughs> see let me tell you I was help me Jesus I am your example follow me okay follow me I remember when I got delivered from my salary. Please hear me. I prophesy now. You gotta get delivered from your salary. Because your standard of living is not supposed to be on your salary. It's supposed to be on the king. Now there's a difference. If you keep looking to your salary, then your salary becomes your source. Which means you become independent again from the king. I had to be delivered. 
Some of you sat here in my last session and you heard the word that a king owns everything and he can move things around. But the problem is the kingdom doesn't work without belief. See, Jesus kept on saying it. According to your faith, according to your faith, do you have faith to believe this? Do you have faith to stop living on your salary? I mean, collect it and use it, but don't let it become your source. Why? He said, because the, the king's reputation hinges on the conditioning of your life. The turn of Israel. Wow. When God decided to become their king, you know, he told Moses, tell them come out to me in the, visit, in the desert and tell them to what? Worship me. What is worship? Putting pressure on the king. Call him great, call him powerful, call him wonderful, call him your God. He says, I will be your God, you will be my people. He's trying to get them to depend. Hallelujah. I'm getting ready to close, but I've got to get this point. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Does anyone try to understand? Please? No, no, no. Do you really? Let me get it. See, when they finally decide to come out of Egypt, they had no guarantee. They didn't know where they was going. They didn't know nothing but no money, no food, no nothing. They just said, okay, Moses, we'll go with you based on your word. Ladies and gentlemen, they were living off a salary in Egypt. Pots of onions, and garlic, free housing, health care, welfare of Egypt. God said, I want you to come out and meet me right in the desert where there is. See, you got to get to the point where you stop. I'm not telling you to leave your job. Stay on your job and get your salary. But get released from it today. Because the king's reputation depends on the state of his citizens. The less you depend on God, the more you've got to provide for yourself. And they came out. What did God do? The minute they decided to come out, God shifted all the money in the banks in Egypt in one night. Shift. You hear me, sir? It didn't happen until they decided to come out and go nowhere. You mean to tell me for 400 years, all that money was theirs. I wonder what is being held up by your independence from God. It says that when they left Egypt, the donkeys were staggering under the weight of the gold and the silver. I mean, these, they were slaves on Monday. On Tuesday, they were the richest people in the desert. Why? They made him their king. And his reputation kicked in. Oh, hallelujah. Now, I remember God kept telling them, tell them they will be my people and I will be their God. That's an important, and God kept repeating that. Why? If you tell the other nations that he is your God, his name is out there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on, somebody. That's why it's important for you to publicly confess who is your God and your king, who is your Lord and your Savior. You got to confess it. Tell people, you know, God is my Lord. I mean, when you're saying it, you ain't just saying it for them. You're saying it to put pressure. Yeah. Lord, have mercy. 
David said, if it was not for the Lord on my side. Kanamurakata. You see, you need to get to the point where you say, God, this is your problem. But don't just say it quietly. Tell everybody that's God's problem. You see, they went out of Egypt. And guess what? Moses set God up. <laughs> Moses went before Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, God said, now the name is out there. Pharaoh said, who? He says, I am that I am sent me and told me to tell you to let the labor force go. Pharaoh says, who is this God? Moses says, you don't want to find out. Just let him go. Come on, somebody. This ain't in your best interest to find out. But if you want to meet him, you might meet him in the wrong way, Moses. So just cooperate. Put pressure on God. And Moses told Pharaoh and all of Egypt about Jehovah. Yes. <laughs> Your life is your life. Your life and your standard of living will change today in the name of the king. Because his name is on the line. Those people came out there and in one night the Lord notice all through the book of Exodus the word Lord is used what is Lord owner he kept shifting things the Bible says he made the Egyptians he made the Egyptians I'm trying to go please it says he made listen he's Lord he can make the guy who said no yesterday say yesterday supposed to rule your life who are you if you are kingdom citizens no bank no institution can run your life after today if he's Lord he will make the Egyptians favorable toward he'll make them oh I like that he'll make them they'll say I don't know why I do this I hate you but here Oh Lord, have mercy. Some of y'all gotta give something. Come on. I feel an anointing here. God said, look, you've been trying to fight them. No, no, no. Just tell them who I am and what I am to you, and the pressure's on heaven now. I told you a moment ago that I am your example. I put an airplane on the refrigerator. And then I started telling everybody, everywhere I go, I said, the Lord will provide for me an airplane. Now, there are two ways to get an airplane. One, you could work 25 years, save all your money, don't buy nothing else, and just buy the plane, and then be too old to fly it and die. Or, you can brag on him and say, look, you got to supply it. I told him, and he'll just shift the thing. You don't understand. He will make them favorable towards you. He's king. Why? Because his reputation. You see, Doc, when you and I go down to Millionaire, down on the airport, and stepped in the jet, they got to say, wow, he must serve a rich government. The reputation of that government must be awesome. You all better shout somebody. It's not about an airplane. It's about his name's sake. Your promotion is not about you. It's about his name's sake. Your business going to multiply after the day. Not because God will make you rich, but he want to make his name great. 
He wants his name to be glorified all over the Bahamas, all over the Caribbean, all over the world. His name shall be glorified. Oh Lord, my God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Give the Lord a praise and shout him, praise his name. I got to go. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.